Um, there's an interesting discussion uh, that I'd like to talk about, start with, uh, that was going on in the chat related to uh, exploration of volatiles and how uh, our in situ exploration of volatiles will have to worry about um, the realities of spacesuit venting and contamination. Um, so Jen, I was wondering if you might be able to start by kind of summarizing some of the concerns that are brought in brought up in the chat and um, some of the strategies um, that NASA is working on to mitigate um, to mitigate that. Yeah, thanks for bringing this up. So it is a concern because we know that spacesuits will vent, even if it's at low levels, there will be gases that are coming out. And so that can contaminate your workspace um, for volatiles and for other studies as well. So there's a few mitigation strategies one could think about. Nothing's been finalized. So um, this would be good for talking about today, but you know, you can try and minimize the venting from the spacesuits. You can try and have the directionality of the venting, you know, don't have it venting out the front part, right, where the astronauts are working and contaminate the tools in the workspace, the venting out the back. You can have the in-situ measurements to help quantify what that contamination is. Um, so there's a few things that can happen there. And then Pascal is pointing out that you can do robotic um, measurements and sample collection and drilling as well without having the humans right there in the workspace. And that's valuable as well. I mean, we're doing that with the earlier robotic missions and CLIPS missions, for example, um, because then you minimize and, you, or, and or eliminate the, the astronaut in the in the workspace. So those are all options. And you know, the study of volatiles is difficult if you want to get into PSRs where you're at tens, hundred k. Um, you know, there's a there's a range of temperatures where the volatiles are, but that also puts more engineering constraints and difficulties on having an astronaut able to work in a condition like that in those low temperatures and also a permanent shadow. So, but it's important that we can also look at transiently shadowed regions where you do get some sunlight, but we still expect to have volatile, you know, in the near subsurface that you can still access. So those are issues. And then another point that was brought up is that, you know, volatiles will, they're fragile, right? So it would be nice from a science perspective if we could study volatiles and characterize them earlier in the program as opposed to later. Um, you know, it's kind of the philosophy that was used when the landing mission was flown, that the lunar exosphere is so fragile. And so once we start having a lot of landings, you know, it will change its natural state. So we wanted to characterize that and that mission was sent earlier. And it's the same philosophy with volatiles, where once we have a lot of missions that are landing and you know, there's all these exciting, um, you know, the manifest for Artemis and all these exciting missions, but with each landing, you have the potential for contamination of these regions. So if we can characterize them earlier, that would be good for science. So that was just a whole lot of words, but <laughs> maybe others um, on the panel as well have um, thoughts on this. Tim, I think you're muted. <laughs> Twice in one day. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, there's also some discussion about um, uh, spectroscopy in the field. Uh, maybe this is Dan, I think, directed towards you. you. You also started kind of answering this in the chat, but I think there's a kind of a few things to think about. One is how EVA intensive um, would you know, any types of field remote sensing measurements have to be, there's a problem of regolith and dust cover versus, you know, clean rocks. Um, and then um, robots, you know, versus humans. What can robots do versus what do you actually need humans to do? I wonder if you would want to expand on any of those points, Dan. I haven't thought much about the dust problem that it, um, it would be. I think a problem. <laughs> I, I don't know how dust covered everything is there. Um, for the um, the other part of the question, I, I, I always envision that some of these hyperspectral um, instruments would be mounted on the rover and that you would drive up and you would acquire the scan while the ask, while the crew is doing something else, getting ready. And then if you could interpret, if you could process those and deliver products quickly, then they might be able to use them for sampling in that same EBA. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. I think so. And then, you know, uh, Dean just had a, another comment uh, in the question in the chat that I think it was motivated by um, your talk and Jose's. Uh, he says, you know, Jose used the term actionable, which is a great term for an EVA 
Um, and so he's asking, is it time to consider a broad division between tools that can provide data that can be used in real time to improve crews activities and those that provide data that's more applicable to long term science results that are less sensitive to real time ops and decision making. I think anybody that anybody could kind of go after this or, or riff on this question. Yeah, I will comment on that. Um, you know, I think there are plenty of examples where despite trying to plan as best as possible for being able to set and forget your instrument. Um, you know, sometimes the set part needs to be trouble needs troubleshooting in in real time and the the value the value of the data that you're going to get in the case of apollo for the next eight years depends very strongly on how well you do that set part and um a lot of the instrument con ops involve some kind of ground check with earth you know do, uh, do you like the signal that you're seeing does everything look good before you know moving on and doing the next thing um, so as long as as long as the setting can be verified and everything looks good, it's part it's built into the con ops, then I think it's okay. I think that's a great point that Dean made in the chat. Um, you know, maybe maybe it is time to start thinking about you know these instruments in, in that capacity. That that said, you know, there there is sort of long term data that you can get from you know something like an XRF, which you know a lot of people would agree it's something that's kind of actionable also, or hopefully would be, um, you know. So, but you know, but working on sort of the output of what these instruments give, I think it's is also important. You know, um, like like was mentioned, I think Deanne mentioned this. You know, it's better for the astronaut to have like a yes or no, or a red or a green um, display rather than a whole output of what you know the elemental composition of a rock is. Um, on the flip side, though, it, it's important to capture all that detailed data for later archival. And so, so basically, having instruments to serve both masters in the most optimal terms, I think, is going to be an important thing to keep in mind. One thing that uh, Deanne um, also touched on was the need for software development and software tools to. Um, make the data the most usable both in the field and, and after the fact. And there was some also some discussion in the chat about uh, uh, from Will Stefanoff, I think started a discussion about um, AI, machine learning, uh, computer vision techniques. Um, Dan, maybe you could speak briefly about kind of um, some progress that's being made in, in those areas um, for interpretation of spectroscopic data. We have not been applying that to our field data yet, but you know we have things going on in the lab where we're um, developing training sets for different uh, mineral mixtures this is for asteroid related work. But certainly there are groups out there that are um, developing the training data sets that you would need to apply machine learning and neural networks to some of these types of data sets and help you identify uh, things uh, very quickly. And if you look in the chat, um, Pascal Lee and uh, Samuel, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last name, but there are other people that are, are working on that as well. I imagine it's not only compositional data, um, not to put you on the spot, Renee, but I assume you know these types of techniques are being actively um, deployed for analysis of seismic data, um, anything that has complex you know, wave signals that need to be disentangled. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the time, those are techniques that are deployed later after significant data has been gathered, especially for seismic, where you're basically just waiting for the ground to do something. So I'm not sure, at least in a lunar environment where, you know, it's very likely that the data return will be in real time or near real time. Um, but th those types of techniques are being looked at very strongly for data limited missions further out in the solar system where some sort of onboard data processing is necessary because you won't be able to send everything back. You're much more likely to be bandwidth limited. Um, getting back to instrument deployment and uh, use of these different types of instruments, Jeff Plesha asks just now in the chat, from a practical standpoint, how do you use these various types of instruments on a stick, handheld, having to put it on the surface, or you have to clean the surface first? Kind of, what's your um, uh, vision for you know, how these different types of instruments are actually operated by you know robots or, or humans? Um, yeah, I assume you're talking about the mineralogical instruments. Actually, Kelsey might be a better person to talk about the XRF. I mean, right now it's a handheld, but I think people have talked about having it set up so that you could just set it down on a rock. 
Um, and then for the spectral imaging, I imagined either it could be mounted low on the rover if you're doing class surveys or high up on a mast. Um, that's, that's how I envision it. I'm not sure if a stick would be stable enough. I mean, you might, I don't know if it would have the stability to acquire a good deal. Yeah, and a lot of these questions are very science question dependent, right? It depends on the science question that you're trying to address. So there's probably not a one answer fits all. And so that's where the science prioritization comes into play, which will drive what the instruments in the con ops end up being. From one of the examples that you gave, Jen, at least some of these instruments could be mounted in a drill. Okay. Yes, yeah, exactly. Like we're putting the VIS near IR spectrometers in a drill, we're putting a neutron spectrometer in a drill. Um, so you can just get your subsurface data in situ um, with minimal disruption to the you know, subsurface stratigraphy and composition for that matter. Um, there was a question earlier about sublimation of molecules and doing the measurements. And so there's a lot of work going on through Viper to characterize this um, because that will be bringing samples up, depositing it on the surface, and then the instruments look at that um, cuttings pile, essentially. So it doesn't all just go away immediately. Um, and it's also depending on the size of your sample. You can minimize the sublimation rates. Um, and some instruments want sublimation. Like the mass spectrometer wants to see yes, it's coming off. So it depends on your technique. Again, it goes back to your science question and your technique and your con ops. So there's a lot of permutations that are in the trade space. Great. Um, I think we hit all of the main points. We got about 20 seconds <laughs> left in our in our Q and A, but I think we hit all the main points. If there are any other, um, uh, if there are any other comments, questions, put them in the chat. We're recording everything um, uh, that will be so this can all be captured in our report afterwards. So I want to thank all of our uh, speakers on this panel uh, once again. This is fantastic.